We are in Galatians chapter one this morning. Uh, if you were to ask me two of my favorite books in the New Testament, James is my favorite book of the Bible, uh, but, but Galatians would probably be the second uh, that would be my favorite uh, book of the Bible. Uh, in 2011, Amanda and I and our family lived in Ethiopia. We were missionaries there, and we were a part of a church plant, Bethel Baptist Church there in uh, Ayat, Ethiopia, which is near the capital city of Addis Ababa, and that church is still going on. And so uh, we started that church in May of 2011. Our teammates went home that summer uh, to visit family, visit churches, the Shadles, who we support here uh, as a church. And, um, and so that summer, uh, in this little house that we were renting for the first church location, uh, we would spend several weeks walking through the book, this letter uh, of Galatians. And, uh, and I can't even go into detail how encouraging that was uh, for my wife and I uh, and 30 to 35 people during their rainy season on cold, rainy days uh, on Sundays to sit and walk through this incredible letter that Paul is writing. And I just love Galatians. I would encourage you, if you've never uh, read Galatians, to spend some time reading it. Uh, I think it would be an encouragement to you. And today we are going to look really at the theme of what Galatians is. And so I'm gonna ask you this question this morning and we've got a lot to cover. And uh, so we're gonna go rapid fire. But if I was to ask you, uh, when I say the word freedom, what does that make you think of? All right, you don't have to answer that out loud. But if I was to ask you what you think of when you think of freedom. Now, naturally being in the culture that we are in, understandably, uh, we might think of the 4th of July and we celebrate freedom. Uh, we might think of the cost of freedom as we honor those that have, uh, have fought for our country on Memorial Day. Uh, we think about history, maybe give me liberty or give me death. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. let freedom ring. We think about President Abraham Lincoln who talked about in the Gettysburg Address this new nation conceived in what liberty or freedom uh, dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. And so maybe for you, those are some of the things that you think of. But this idea of freedom that we're going to look at goes a lot further back in time than just that. And we value freedom, which we should. Uh, it's celebrated in popular culture. We think about William Wallace and Braveheart. And, and the many times I've watched the movie Braveheart and I've watched certain scenes in that movie that get me excited about freedom. And maybe for you, it's a different feeling. I was thinking about it this week. And uh, for me, that, that goes back to 1994, the day I got my driver's license. And so it was February, 1994. Uh, I went and took my, my test in Monticello, Illinois. And you always go to the small town, all right? That's the place to get your, your license. And so um, uh, my town was 1,200. This was like 6,000. So both towns were small. Um, and, and so I went there, and I remember that afternoon, I, I took my dad's truck out, and, uh, and he didn't have a cassette player, and so I had a boom box with batteries, all right? And uh, I was a member of Columbia House, and so I had 30 free cassettes, and so I had an Ace of Bass tape, and, uh, and I had that, I had, hey, it was, <laughs> it was that funny, all right? But anyway, I, I drove out in the country, and uh, listening to... The sign by Ace of Base, all right? <laughs> freedom, that was freedom. First time in my life legally I was driving, all right? But that was freedom, right? I'm just driving around, enjoying life, and enjoying the, the 20 degree weather that, that February day in 1994. But that maybe is what you think of when you think about freedom. You think about a certain time of your life, a certain period of your life, and, and maybe that's the case. And, this brings us back to Galatians, though, because this idea of freedom that Paul is talking about uh, is much more than we think of when we think of national freedom, uh, much more than we think about freedom of conveniencies that we might have. This, this freedom that Paul talks about is focused on eternity, and that's what Galatians is all about. Uh, what separates Christianity, and I'm going to say this a couple of times, and Really what separates Christianity from the other religions in the world is this freedom that we're talking about. And that's the gospel and that's the grace of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Galatians chapter one, I wanna read this passage of scripture and then we are gonna pray and then we're gonna jump into it this morning. 
Verse one in Galatians one says, Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ. God, the father who raised him from the dead and all the brethren who are with me, grace to you. Peace from God, the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and father to whom the glory forever and ever, amen. I, I marvel or I'm astonished that you are turning away so soon from him who has called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who troubled you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we are an angel from heaven were to preach any other gospel to you than what you have preached, been preached to you, let him be accursed. Verse nine, as I said before, I'm gonna say it again. If anyone preaches another gospel to you, then what you have received, let him be accursed. For now, do I persuade God or do I persuade men? Do I seek to please men? For if I still please men, I would not be the bond servants of Christ. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, again, we are grateful for the opportunity to look at the gospel. Grateful that hope is found in you. Grateful for the sufficiency of your word. And so, Lord, I pray right now that our hearts, our minds would be focused on you and that your spirit would work in our hearts. Lord, convict us where we need to be convicted. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Let me give you a little bit of a background. If as I was to say that uh, Galatians has had an impact on church history, um, that would be putting it mildly. Uh, it is a massive book in church history. Uh, in fact, Martin, Martin Luther, great theologian, leader of the Reformation, some of you maybe have heard of him. Uh, this is what he stated about Galatians. The epistle to the Galatians is my epistle. Uh, to it, I am as if we're in wedlock. Galatians is my Catherine, which was the name of his wife. Now, what Martin Luther was saying here is that the book of Galatians was very, very special to him. Now, you might say, well, why was that? Well, it was his study and his submissive uh, uh, study of the scripture, specifically Galatians, that, that Luther understood God's message of salvation was through grace. And you say, well, what's the big deal about that? Well, for uh, years and years and years and years and years in church history, the, the church b taught a belief system, the Roman Catholic Church taught a belief system that you had to work to earn your way to God, that you had to do certain things. And so for Martin Luther, as he's studying Galatians, and, and everyone is buying into this idea of what the church was teaching, that, that he studied Galatians, the Holy Spirit worked in his heart, convicted him, and he opened his eyes spiritually to the realization that, that salvation is by grace in Jesus Christ. And, and so for Martin Luther, who, who led this reformation saying, hey, look, we, we don't buy into this false teaching, but, but salvation is by grace, who led this charge, th this changed his life. And so naturally, it is a massive part of church history. The message of Galatians is simple. This is not on your handouts. You can write it down if you like, but this is the message summed up of Galatians. The message of Galatians is the message of the Christian spiritual freedom, his deliverance by Christ from the bondage of sin and religious legalism. The message of Galatians is the message of the Christian spiritual freedom, his deliverance by Christ from the bondage of sin and religious legalism. Now, let me give you, again, a little bit more of a background. Paul is writing this letter to the churches in Galatia. If you're not familiar with Paul, a uh, very famous, well-known missionary, wrote a lot of the New Testament. Before Paul was radically changed and saved, uh, he had zeal, he had passion. Unfortunately, it was for things that were not good. And so Paul was very zealous, uh, he was very knowledgeable, but he also was responsible for, for scores of Christians dying, literally. Their blood was on his hands until Christ radically changed him on the road to Damascus. And Paul's life would never be the same. And from that moment on, Paul would go around preaching the good news of Jesus Christ. He would start churches, he would go on mission trips, he would do a number of things. One of the great, if not the greatest missionary in world history would have been the Apostle Paul. And, and so he's writing to these churches, 
that are, that are located in Galatia, these young churches, these new Jewish believers. The, the idea, the area would be modern Turkey. Uh, in, in today's map, is what we would look at to where these churches were. Now, he's writing because there's a crisis going on in these churches. He, he is, he's seeing people saved by faith through Jesus, but these false teachers were coming in, what we would call Judaizers, were coming in, and they were proclaiming that, hey, look, if you want to believe in Jesus as the Messiah, then that's fine, but you also need to be circumcised. So if you want to go with Jesus, that's fine, not a problem, but you also need to make sure that you add circumcision to it. And so Paul is writing this letter, and the whole crux of Galatians is this idea that he's writing to these young believers that he loves, these brothers and sisters in Christ, that are following Jesus, but they're getting carried away by this idea. Well, should I be circumcised because I I believe in Jesus, but should I do this as well? And, And so Paul is writing and basically saying, look, that's not what the gospel message is about. And so throughout Galatians, you see this passion of Paul, this idea that he's proclaiming that true freedom is not found in doing this, this, and this, but true freedom is found only in Jesus Christ. Now, Paul experienced that. Again, he radically experienced that. And so for Paul, this is personal. These are his brothers and sisters in Christ. These are churches that he helped start And these are these young Christians that are getting carried away by this idea, well, I need Jesus, but I also need that. And Paul's message is pretty, pretty simple. He's saying, look, that's not the gospel message. That's not the gospel message. So don't buy into this false teaching. The Galatians is all about freedom. Galatians is all about grace. It's all about the word hope. And and Paul's message is this. True freedom is found only in Jesus. The gospel of Jesus. That's important for you and I because we live in a world that's influxed with information. Whatever you want to do works for you. Whatever works for me works for me. And what Paul is saying, what the gospel says, is that's not the gospel. That's not the gospel. Like you can go and try to do whatever you want to get to God, but there's only one way to be reconciled to God, and that's through Jesus Christ. There's a story told of a conference going on. It's a religion conference, and there's a lot of participants there, and they're arguing why Christianity is unique. The teaching that God became man, and some would object to that, and they would say other religions teach different and similar similar doctrines as well. They kept arguing about it. It grew heated eventually. Well, at some point during this discussion, C.S. Lewis, a strong defender of Christianity, author many of us know, would come in late, he would sit down, he would ask, what is the deal, what is going on here? He learned about the debate, he stood up and he said, what's the difference between Christianity? That's simple, grace, and he walked out. Now you might say that's a a simple answer, but sometimes the simplest answers are the best answers. And, And what I'm afraid happens in our life at times is, again, if I'm being honest with you, I, I love Galatians chapter one, It's one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. But I struggled even with this message. I felt like the Lord, this is where he wanted me to go. But I struggled with it because it's such a simple and clear message. The basics of gospel, it's 101. That we are saved by grace through Jesus Christ. And sometimes what I'm afraid of is that we gloss over that. Like like it becomes so routine, it becomes so every day that we don't realize just how incredibly amazing and wonderful and profound that that grace really is. And that's what Paul's message is about. I I love this quote, the very heart of the gospel is the supreme truth that God accepts us with no condition, whatever when we put our trust in the atoning sacrifice of his incarnate son. Although we are helplessly sinful, God in grace forgives us completely. It's by his infinite grace we are saved. Not by moral character, not by works of righteousness, not by commandment keeping or church going. When we do nothing else, 
but accept God's total pardon, we receive the guarantee of eternal life. Right. Nothing else. Now, I, I don't know that I have to state it, and I've probably stated it numerous times. Those things are important. Going to church is important. Titus talks about grace motivating us, right? Growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Those things are, are valuable. Reading your Bible, stepping out in obedience. But what saves us is not this, this, and this. What saves us is Jesus, and that's it. It's not Jesus plus circumcision. It's not Jesus plus church going. It's not Jesus plus baptism. It's not Jesus plus this, this, and this. It's just Jesus. Now, should you be baptized and step in obedience? Yes. Should you be a part of church? Yes. In fact, I would argue those, and there are those, and maybe this is your story at one time, that would say, I love Jesus, but I don't love church, doesn't understand the gospel, just doesn't, because the gospel is centered around believers gathering together. But the message of Galatians and what Paul is saying is very, very simple. It's grace. And if you add anything else other to, to grace, other than grace, it ceases to be grace. And that's the message that Paul is proclaiming. Now, going back to why it was so special for us in Ethiopia there in 2011 is because Ethiopia, steeped in biblical history, had a lot of biblical tradition, but they didn't have a lot of biblical freedom. And there's a difference between the two. Maybe you're here this morning and you have biblical tradition. Maybe your parents raised you in church. Maybe you've been in church since you were two years old, but you've never experienced biblical freedom. Because I, I want you to understand, your parents taking you to church doesn't save you. You growing up in church does not save you. You going to VBS does not save you. You getting baptized as a baby did not save you. Salvation is found only in Jesus Christ. And that's not what our world wants to hear. That's not what our culture wants to hear, right? Our culture thrives on this idea. You do whatever you wanna do. Don't offend me. I'm not gonna offend you. But the gospel at times offends. It offends. It's not me. It's the gospel. It offends because there's only one way to get to God. There's only one way to be reconciled, and that's through Jesus Christ. And sometimes I'm afraid we forget that, we take that for granted. So Paul's message here is this idea of the gospel. The answer is being Jesus. Three things that I wanna look at quickly. Number one is this. The gospel is freedom's pathway. The gospel is freedom's pathway. Verses one and two, again, Paul, an apostle, not from man, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. All the brethren who are with me. Two things that jump out here very, very quickly and then we're moving on to point two. Two things. Most of the time when Paul would write a letter and he wrote many letters in the New Testament, many books of the New Testament, he would have a, a section of thanksgiving. He doesn't do that here. Like Paul is ready to get into the crux of what this is about. It's not about Paul it's not about his credentials, not about those things. It's about the gospel. And so he's not giving some thanksgiving here, like he's ready to go. Second thing is, eight out of the 12 letters that he writes, he, he talks about the fact that he's an apostle. But this time he says, I'm an apostle because that's what Jesus has called me to be. So Paul's ready to get into what this is about. Have you ever had a friend that when you talk to on the phone, they're like right to the point, and then they're really good about getting off the phone, all right? Those people are the best, okay? <laughs> and if you're like, I don't know those people, you're the opposite, okay? And that's okay, there's nothing wrong with that. I enjoy at times having long conversations. I really do, I do. But then there are those that are just so good, like they know, like I'm calling, this is what it's about, all right, we'll talk later, okay? Boom, conversation done, all right? That's the best, all right? Then you have some people that are like, yeah, well, all right, I'll see you later. Okay, it's good talking to you, and it's like awkward, all right? My friend Matt, by the way, he's really good about getting off the phone. When it's, when it's time to get off the phone, Matt doesn't mess around. That's the greatest compliment. It's not the greatest compliment I could give Matt, but that's a high compliment I could give him, all right? Now, there are people like that. Well, Paul, that, that's what Paul's doing here. Paul's giving a greeting. 
and saying, look, here, I'm Paul, I'm an apostle. Christ call me, let's get into this. I'm not messing around here. Why? Because this is personal to him. Like Paul understands that it's not about Paul. Paul understands it's not about the other apostles. Paul understands that this is about the gospel. And listen, I, I hate to break this to you and I, but it's not about you and me. It's not about us. And again, that flies into the face of what the culture would tell us. Culture would say, make it about you. The gospel says, it's not about you. It's about Jesus. So we see that, number one, the gospel is for his pathway. Number two, he gets straight to the point, the gospel is the Father's plan. The gospel is the Father's plan, verses three through five. And I love the fact you can look Genesis all the way to Revelation, you see this story. This is what it says. Grace to you and peace from God the Father, Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age, according to the will of God our Father, God and the Father, to whom be glory forever and ever, amen. This is the gospel summed up. Like if you want a summary of the gospel in a verse, this is one of those verses you could go to. And Paul states it, make grace to you, peace. He gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age, that we might be released from the bondage of sin. We're still in this present world, but that we might spiritually be free, that he would deliver us according to the will of God the Father. This is the gospel, this idea, this glorious idea that, that God is here to rescue us that he is to free us from the bondage of sin. Many of you have experienced that freedom from the bondage of sin, and you're here to proclaim it and testify to it. 1 Corinthians 15 says this, for I deliver you first of all that which I also receive. Again, Paul's saying this, that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. He was buried, he rose again the third day according to the scripture. I read this somewhere, the gospel is spelled done, D-O-N-E, because Christ has done on the cross everything needed for salvation, everything. That's the beauty of the gospel. That's the beauty of grace. That's what grace is about, unmerited favor that Christ lavishes upon our lives. Salvation is not by this and this. It's a by Jesus. Amen. Listen, one of my favorite things in ministry, I will say this a thousand times, is having an, a, the humble opportunity to participate in baptisms. I love it. Love doing it in Ethiopia. Got to baptize both of my boys, uh, Jackson here, Aramaeus in Ethiopia. And I just love it. It makes me just, brings a lot of joy to my heart. But I always say to people, look, you, 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 you get baptized because of obedience but that's not saving you. That's right. And I, I love testimony after testimony, and maybe this is you, and maybe you need to be baptized, of people that will say, Craig, I, I was baptized when I was a baby, and for so long I was holding on to that, that that was making me right with God. And, I, and, and the Holy Spirit has convicted me to realize that that's not it. Or Craig, I, I was been afraid, but I wanna get baptized now. And I always tell people, I say, you, the, the example that you're setting to your family to your friends, and the recognition that I'm saved, I, I've accepted that free gift of salvation, but now I'm going to step out in obedience and I'm gonna get baptized. But that's not adding to salvation. That's not adding to what needs to be done. It's Jesus plus absolutely nothing. That's the beauty of grace. Amen. That's the beauty of the gospel. Ephesians 2, for by grace, you've been saved through faith, not of yourself, it's the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. There's nothing you and I can do to get to God, nothing. Like you can have the, the most education, you can have all the money, you can have all the fame, you can have all the knowledge, you can have all this, this, and this, but if you are separated from God, all that is a waste. It's a waste. There's nothing we can do to get to God. Grace, we've been saved through faith. Grace means that God gives us what we do not deserve. That's why it's amazing. When we're born again, when we receive that gift of salvation, we're freed from the penalty of sin. That's the beauty of the gospel. That's the beauty of what Paul is saying about. He's passionate about that. He's saying, look, it's not circumcision plus this. It's just Jesus. It's just Jesus. 
If you've been reading with us the 40 Days of Grace, it's been so very, very good. I, I want to read a quote from day two. Grace has the power to do what nothing else can do. It rescues you from you, and in so doing, restores you what you were created to be. We'll read that again. Grace has the power to do what nothing else can do, rescue you from you, and in so doing, restore you to what you were created to be. That's day two if you want that quote later. Meaning this, we need help and we have no one else to blame. We need help. Like we're our own worst, we're sinners. The Bible says that our sin is as filthy rags. That doesn't fly in today's culture, okay? Like it's common to want to blame this, this, and this. This person did this, this person did this. Now, I'm not minimizing at times what people have done in your life by, by, by any stretch. I'm not minimizing that at all. But ultimately, we are to blame for our sinful condition. And, and this is what it says in Ephesians. This is not on your screen. That at time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, no hope and without God in this world. If I was to say that verse, no hope, no help without God, and walk off the stage, that would be incredibly discouraging, okay? We would get done a little early, but it would be discouraging, all right? But that's what it says, no hope. So if that was the end of it, then we're in a lot of trouble. We're in a lot of trouble. But that's not all. That's not the story. The hope-infused story of the scripture is that we're not on our own. Like God is in the business of rescuing and restoring. That's the beauty of the gospel. That's the beauty of grace. Grace to you, peace, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age. We want spiritual freedom. It's found in Jesus. That's where it's found. Again, it's not found in your job. It's not found in your family. All those things are great. But spiritual freedom is found only in Jesus Christ. Amen. Some of your stories are you spent years and years and years trying to get that freedom, and then you finally experience it through Jesus Christ. Some of your stories are you're still searching and you're still looking for that spiritual freedom, and I'm here to tell you, you go ahead and try to do everything this world wants you to do. You're never going to find the freedom that comes from Jesus Christ. Right. You never will. That's the gospel. Again, if you don't know Paul's story, as I shared, he had that zeal. He had the, the zeal and the passion for the wrong things. Literally, the blood of Christians were on his hands. And then Jesus radically changed his life. And so now Paul, you can see why he's passionate here. Because he had experienced that grace. He experienced that freedom. And so now he's going around spending the rest of his life saying, look, this is the gospel. It's just Jesus. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you this, and I, I believe this with all my heart. If you are at a point in your life where it is the bleakest, and maybe some of you are there, maybe some of you have been there. I think at times we've all been there at times but maybe that's where you're at today. And it's like the bleakest of bleakest, like you are barely hanging on. Whatever that looks like, family issues going on, health issues going on, marriage on the rocks, struggling with addictions, whatever that looks like. I, I believe, with, without a shadow, I believe in my heart, because I know that if you have breath in your lungs, that there's always hope with Jesus. There's always hope with Jesus. Now, I'm not gonna assault you and say, hey, read these two verses and everything's gonna be okay tomorrow because that's not necessarily gonna happen. There's at times steps that have to be taken. Sometimes there's guardrails that need to be put up, friends that need to be taken out of the equation, new friends that need to come in, steps that need to take place, hard decisions, hard conversations. Those things have to happen at times. But I believe without any question that, listen, if you are in a state in your life where you feel like that you can't go much longer, that listen, as long as you're breathing, that there is hope in Jesus Christ. 
You might say, Craig, how do you know that? I will tell you how I know that for a couple reasons. Number one, it doesn't matter what I say. It matters what Jesus says, and you see it in Scripture. Time and time again, Paul again, responsible for believers dying. Not a figurative speech here, right? Literally, Christ changed his life, and he spent the rest of his life proclaiming the grace of Jesus Christ. You can see story after story in the Bible. I experienced that grace in my own life. Again, I grew up in church, but at 10 years old, the Lord radically changed my life. Now, I made a lot of mistakes. He's been faithful, he's been gracious. But he spiritually freed me from the bondage of sin and gave me eternal life. And I also know because of your testimonies. I've heard many of your testimonies and I know your stories. And I know that Christ has, has given you victory. And I wanna encourage you, if there's one thing and you're here today and you're dealing with addictions or you're dealing with struggles or maybe it has nothing to you, do with you but it's things going on in your family, do not give up hope. Amen. Do not give up hope. I'm not saying that flippantly. I'm not just patting you on the back. I'm telling you, I'm here. Your church is here. You're going to get through this. You keep trusting the Lord. Yeah. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that lightly. Please don't misunderstand. I'm not saying that flippantly. But I believe that through the power of Jesus, that, that victory can be found. Amen. I believe through the power of Jesus, the grace of Jesus, that the, the bonds of sin can be released. That's the message of the gospel. That is what Paul is saying here. He's telling his own story, and he's saying it's Jesus, 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 Jesus. Freedom is found in Jesus, and that's it. Number three, quickly, the gospel is fervently proclaimed. The gospel is fervently proclaimed. So not only is it the pathway, not only is it the plan, but it's fervently proclaimed, verses six through 10. Now it might be in your Bible, and if not, write this down, one gospel. Verses six through 10, sort of a heading, might be one gospel. This is what he says, we'll break this down. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who's called you in the grace of Christ. I marvel, the idea marvel there means to be astonished, to be amazed, right? To be flabbergasted. I don't know if anybody ever uses flabbergasted anymore, but that would be that meaning. Paul is saying, I, I, I'm amazed, I am marveled, I'm shocked, I'm bewildered, I'm flabbergasted that you who have experienced the grace of Jesus in your life are quickly walking away. Now, he's not saying that they're walking away and that they're, they're, they're leaving their salvation. They're, they're, they're saved, right? They're young believers in the faith. They're in the milk, the Bible says. But they're getting caught up in this idea that, hey, it's okay to believe in Jesus, but do I need to be circumcised? Like they're questioning what, what is being taught. And, and Paul is saying, look, you're my brothers and sisters. I love you. And I'm amazed that you're buying into this false gospel, to this perversion is what he says. That, that the Christ that has called you by the grace that, that you're listening to something different, which is not another, but there are some that want to pervert the gospel of Christ. Verses eight and nine. But even if we, or an angel from heaven, preach another gospel to you, then what has been preached, let him be accursed. So now Paul says, look, even if one of us comes, or say an angel from heaven comes, right? And Paul knows that's not gonna happen. But even if an angel from heaven comes and preaches something contrary to the gospel of Christ, curse him. That's what he means. Then I love verse nine. This is what he says, all right? He basically says this. In a nutshell, if anyone preaches the gospel other than Christ, even if it's an angel, curse him. No, no, I don't think you quite grasp what I'm saying. If someone else comes and preaches the gospel that's not the gospel, curse him. He repeats himself twice because Paul is so confident in what the gospel is, that it's Jesus. And he's so confident because it's changed his own life. Yeah, I, I love, we're doing these 40 days of grace. And I gotta get going. We're doing these 40 days of grace. We're leading up to our missions conference in February. Ties in with the theme. Can't wait to share that theme. Very, very excited about our missions conference. 
Decide what God has in store. That ties in together. And I just love the fact that, that we have stories of how Jesus has changed our life. If you don't have that story, today can be that day. It can be that day. If you've never accepted that gift of salvation, today can be the day. I don't care if you grew up in church. I don't, I don't care if you were baptized, you were born, day two, you were baptized, all right? Doesn't matter if you've not accepted the gift of salvation, that free gift. Now, I, I'm not saying that flippantly because I understand that there's, there's history and there's family and there's connections there. But what we see Paul saying here is very, very clear. Nothing gets you to God apart from Jesus Christ. It's the grace of Jesus in your life, lavished upon you. So stop being in spiritual bondage because you're trying to earn your way to God. There's nothing you and I can do to earn our way to God. That, that was in Ethiopia, again, we have men and women that we love, but they're trying to do this, this, and this to get to God. They're trying to keep all these things. And that's never going to work. It's never going to work. That's why Jesus came to pay that ultimate price. So he says, again, I marvel at these things. I'm amazed at these things. I'm astounded at these things. This is what Paul is saying in a nutshell here. When law, even God's law is added to grace, it no longer is grace. If you add anything to grace, it ceases to be grace. Paul is saying throughout the whole letter to the churches in Galatia, there is one true gospel, and that is the name of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Romans eleven six says this, and if by grace, then it is no longer of works, otherwise grace is no longer grace. If it is of works, it is no longer grace, otherwise work is no longer work. What is he saying? You are saved by grace. If you add something to that, it ceases to be grace. It ceases to be grace. And encouragement for you this morning, if you've never experienced that freedom, man, experience it today. If you've never experienced the freedom that Jesus offers, experience it today. If you've grown up in church, and again, you have a history of religion, I know that's hard, but man, today can be that day of freedom. Today can be that day of freedom. I don't have time to tell this, but I'm going to tell it anyway, all right? Pastor Grant says that once in a while, all right? Don't tell him. Um, in Ethiopia, I, you have heard me talk about our neighbor, Hannah. I did not share this first service, but the realization is it's been a few years since I talked about Hannah, and a lot of you are new, all right? Hannah was our neighbor. Very quick summary of the story. Hannah was our neighbor. Ethiopian, grew up in Canada. Her dad was Ethiopian Orthodox. Her stepdad, her grandfather, was Muslim, I believe. I have to look at that, but it was one of the two. She moved in next to us, 2011. We got to meet her, her husband, two kids. Wonderful, wonderful, kind, gracious lady. Love Hannah, love Hannah very much. Hannah went to one of our sister churches, heard the gospel for the first time in her life. Gloriously saved. Lord changed her life, changed her life. She was baptized at Bethel Baptist Church, January 2012. First person We'll go back in church history of Bethel Baptist Church. Hannah Tessima, first person baptized, January 2012. Hannah had all the religion. Hannah had all the knowledge. Hannah had all these things, but she had not experienced the gift of salvation through grace in Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit opened her eyes and she released from the bondage of sin. It's beautiful. She was baptized. She served in our church. Two years later, age of 31, she passes away from cancer. Hannah is with the Lord today. She is singing the, the praises of Jesus, not because of what she did, not because of her father or her grandfather, but because she realized her need for a savior. And that's what the gospel message is. The gospel message is this. You and I don't deserve it, but God lavishes his grace upon us and we have an opportunity to be reconciled to God by accepting that free gift of salvation. That's the beauty of the gospel. This is what Tim Keller says there at the bottom of your handout. The Christian gospel is that I am so flawed that Jesus had to die for me, yet I am so loved and valued that Jesus was glad to die for me. 
The Christian gospel is that I'm so flawed that Jesus had to die for me, yet I am so loved and valued that Jesus was glad to die for me. This letter that Paul is teaching is a, his unyielding convictions of the gospel, what it means to him, what it is about this gospel of grace. If you were to watch and walk through the end of Galatians 6.18, brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Paul starts with grace and he ends with grace. That's what changes everything. That's what changes everything. Every head bowed and every eyes closed. I want to have an opportunity to pray here this morning. And again, I, I struggled in this message. I love this passage, but I struggle in this message because it's just very, very simple. And as I'm praying through this this last week and I'm walking through this scripture and I'm walking through what the Lord would have for us, I really sort of narrowed it down, I believe, to four groups of people. The first group, and this might be who you fall into this morning, is that you are saved. You've given your life to Jesus. There's been a time in your life where you've put your faith and trust in Jesus, but you've sort of forgotten the, the, the amazing beauty of grace. Like you just sort of take it for granted. Like it's a common every day, every Sunday, we don't hear about it. Yeah, it's good, grace. Man, I wanna encourage you this morning, just take some time to be grateful for that grace that was lavished upon your life. Because you and I do not deserve that grace. That is what grace is about. But God, because of his love and his mercy, show that grace upon us. So, man, I, I would encourage you, if that's your story, just spend some time. I think all of us at one time or another that are believers take for granted grace. Spend some time today and just thank the Lord for his grace where he brought you, who you were to who you are now. I think there are some here that are believers. You've given your life to Jesus. And you would not publicly say it, but you're sort of trying to keep a checklist because you're sort of concerned to make sure that God still loves you. And what Paul would say is that that's really not what grace is. So my encouragement for you this morning is, again, you wouldn't say, you know that you're saved by grace, but also that you in your own life maybe are keeping that checklist. Like, I, I don't wanna lose the love of God. Listen, there's nothing you and I can do to separate ourselves from the love of God. Nothing we can do. So I want you to rest in that promise that no matter how much you've messed up, no matter how many mistakes you've made, that God still loves you and God still cares for you. And there might be some of you here that, that perhaps that you are in bondage right now in your life and sin. Like you are struggling in certain areas of your life. And, and I, again, as I said earlier, I, mean, I wanna encourage you to do not give up hope. Like, like spiritual victory can be found in Jesus. That, that bondage of sin can be free because of Jesus. And you might have to put some accountability in place. You might have to make some hard decisions. But I, I don't want you to give up. I just don't want you to give up. And then maybe there's some here this morning you would say, Craig, I've never experienced that spiritual freedom. And today might be that day. Look, I, I, I'm, I'm grateful if you grew up in church. And I've had stories in, in, of people that have told me that they grew up in church, but it was not a church preaching the gospel. And, and I'm grateful for the lessons that maybe you learned there, moral lessons, lessons about family, lessons about being faithful. And, and those things are not to be minimized. But when it comes down to it, have you ever accepted God's free gift of salvation? It does not matter if you grew up in church. It does not matter if you were baptized. Those things are important. And I don't want to minimize those things. But if you have never accepted that free gift of salvation, one day all of us will stand before the King of Kings and we're going to have to answer that question. And my prayer is every one of us can look and say, I, I, I gave my life to Jesus. I put my faith and trust in him. I accepted his atoning work on the cross. John 3, 16 says, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, 
that whosoever believes on him should not perish but have everlasting life. Romans goes on to say that we have all sinned and we've all fallen short of the glory of God. I mean, we're all sinners. We all make mistakes. None of us are perfect here. Has there been a time in your life that you can look back and you can say that I have sought forgiveness and I've put my faith and trust in Jesus for salvation? Doesn't mean life is gonna be perfect. Doesn't mean that you have everything figured out. But there really needs to be a time in your life that you have accepted that free gift of salvation. If you've not done that today, it can be the day. And I wanna encourage you to make today the day. I'm gonna pray for us and I'm gonna encourage you to pray this prayer after me. It's not the magical words that I say. It's not what you say, but it's believing on your heart that Christ has died for you, confessing your sin and asking him to forgive you. And so I would encourage you to pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I need you. I believe you have died in my place and I want to receive you today as Savior. If you have prayed that prayer this morning, the Bible says that you're a new creation. The old has walked away, the new is new. That you are free from the bondage of sin for eternal that, that your life is secure in Jesus. And man, I, I can't think of a greater way to celebrate 2024. And I know maybe for some that that's a hard decision to make because maybe that's contrary to what you were taught. Maybe that's contrary to how you grew up. But if that's you today, and you've accepted that free gift of salvation, that is the, the greatest decision you'll ever make, ever. And I would encourage you to let somebody know there's fresh start bags in the back and the balcony as well on the wall. There's a Bible in there. There's information in there. I would encourage you to grab one of those, talk to one of us. We'd love to talk to you about growing in your faith. And as I close here in prayer and Pastor Grant comes up, I do want to pray for those that maybe just struggling in your life, taking for granted the grace that we have and don't give up hope. And keep fighting. Fight for your family. Fight. Keep trusting in the Lord. Keep trusting Him. Keep going to Him. Crying out to Him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, we are thankful this morning. Thankful for the grace that has been offered to us through Jesus. Thank you for the hope that we have. Thank you for those that have put their faith and trust in you this morning. Father, I am grateful for the opportunity that we have just to gather for those that are struggling in their life. God, I pray for victory. For those that are praying for loved ones, I pray for victory. I pray for freedom from the bondage of those things that are entrapping. And I pray, God, again, that we would be reminded of the freedom that is in you. Thank you for your grace and mercy. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.